So finally back, I've been, I think I've been saying for about a year now that I was going to release the portion of the code on the electron electron repulsion integral. So I, I am still super busy, but you know, it's, I was, I was just going through my channel the other day cause it had been so long. And I just realized that I had, uh, been telling people that, uh, uh, I do have the code, but the video is not made. Sometimes, like last year, I was like, hey, the video is coming next week. <laughs> uh, obviously, it didn't come next week, more like next year. Uh, anyways, so I've been, I've been just telling people I'm busy and, the, and I haven't forgotten, and I haven't forgotten. So I do want to talk about, uh, just, just at least show you guys and, and walk you through it quick. So I found my old uh, uh, file on my old laptop. I, I've switched to a Mac now. And I just wanted to, I, well, well, I cleaned it up a little bit and I just want to walk you through the program that I have now. So I, I got rid of the markdown and sort of resimplified things. So these are just basic imports. We did have a primitive Gaussian class. I do explain this a lot in the first video, but briefly our Gaussian, like if you just think of a Gaussian function, you have an alpha term. Uh, if you have a, you're going to have linear combinations of Gaussian, so each one will need a contraction coefficient. You have a coordinate because your Gaussian has to exist in, in three-dimensional space somewhere, so you, you need coordinates for it. Uh, you have this this a term, which is a normalization constant. Uh, this is what we have if all of this is what the normalization constant is is all of if all of these angular momentum terms are zero, which they will be because our Hartree-Fock program will only use s orbitals as basis functions, so there won't be p orbitals or d orbitals. It's just simply s orbitals. Uh, we'll be simulating a H2 molecule, maybe even a helium hydride, potentially. So uh, that that's another thing we can do. But anyways, this is the normalization constant. If you were to have non-zero L values, so like L is 1, that would be a P orbital. L is 2, that would be a D orbital. You would have uh, much more terms over here. I, I do think we can eventually get to that, though. Anyways... So we solved, uh, I showed you how to write a function to compute the overlap matrix, showed you how to write a function to compute the kinetic energy uh, matrix. We ended up doing the electron nuclear attraction integral uh, for, you know, using the Z as like uh, I, I showed in, this was, this would have been the last video. Um, so yeah, this basically we, we loop over basis sets, each basis set, uh, each basis function, for example, like a 1s orbital may contain many primitive Gaussians depending on the basis set you want to use. So uh, that's like the origin of looping over bases and then looping over primitive Gaussians. Uh, just recall here we have this Boyce function in the electron nuclear attraction because you have this 1 over r term between the distance from the electron to the nuclei you're interested in. And in order to get this out of the denominator, we had to do a Fourier transform. And Fourier transform, of course, has consequences. So what you have to do is some other manipulation. And through that, you actually end up with a Boyce function eventually. So it's something similar here. So I'm just going to slowly go through this. Uh, you guys can take the time and copy it down for your, to follow along. The reason why I have you copy it down here is because that's essentially my trade-off. Um, I like you guys to view the channel so I can get the views and in return I can give you guys this. So basically uh, this is the this is the function to compute the electron electron repulsion matrix. So this is this at the end of the day this function returns to you a, a matrix of numbers. okay It takes molecule as an argument. Uh, recall from the previous videos that molecule is a list of basis functions. So by basis functions, we are only using 1s orbitals, and each of our 1s orbitals will have a certain number of primitive Gaussians to describe it. So the number of basis uh, functions that we have is equal to the, will be equal to the length of molecule. Our electron-electron repulsion matrix is a four-dimensional matrix that is n basis by n basis by n basis by n basis. Now it's kind of crazy. I, I really can't visualize it, to be honest. Um, so then what we do is we simply have to do this four, sort of four, four loops here. Uh, the reason we have to do this is because we're essentially taking products, 
where we're simply, we're, our, if you think of the broquette uh, with the operator in the middle, one over r i j, on the left, we're going to have an orbital product, and on the right, we're going to have an orbital product. So we have these sort of four orbitals. So we're going to be going over four for loops here. And then, of course, each one of these for loops is over the basis, the, our, our basis functions. And the basis functions each contain a variable number of primitive Gaussians. So we then have to do an additional set of for loops here. And it's really here that this program will struggle. This will be the bottleneck. And this is simply for educational purposes only, but I'm just showing you how we would loop over the basis functions, and each basis function uh, is described by a list of primitive Gaussians, so we have to then subsequently loop over those primitive Gaussians. Anyways, uh, if you've watched the previous videos, we then compute a normalization constant. We compute uh, the product of contraction coefficients for each sort of orbital or basis function. And then what we do here is we have to do some uh, sort of simple, so we, we describe variables to simplify the process of computing the uh, products of the radial components. So when you actually go and solve this thing, and, and I found a really nice uh, paper, by the way, it's a new one, I'll, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, you basically, uh, use the Gaussian product theorem to simplify the approach. So if you have two orbitals or in space, you can use the Gaussian product theorem to make a two-center integral into a one-center integral. But here we have, uh, we're going to have two cases of this. So essentially it, it gets a little more con convoluted. And um, I just wanted to make this video to let you guys know that I have been thinking about this for quite a while and, and wanted to just show you. So long story short, this is all of the, uh, this is the way I have implemented it. And basically here, uh, we get these four terms at the bottom. And these terms are only dealing with the radial component. So this is essentially what we'll be using uh, for our s orbitals. Uh, also, you have this boys term here. This term, again, arises from the fact that we had this one over rij term, and we wanted to get that out of the denominator. So what we did was we took a Fourier transform, and then once we had this Fourier transform, that has some consequences. We still have some terms in the in denominator we don't want to be there. So we end up figuring out that we can use this voice function. This is like really complicated math that I probably couldn't have done without having read it somewhere else. Uh, in, in the event that we do uh, want to describe higher order angular momentum terms, such as p orbital or d orbital, there will actually be three additional terms here. But since we're only considering s orbitals, uh, this way of expressing the matrix element is sufficient, okay? So you can see we have this, this absolutely, I'll zoom out, absolutely massive uh, eight for loops structure. Uh, it's quite crazy. But yeah, this is the electron-electron repulsion integral. And it's going to, the end result is going to be a four-dimensional matrix. Uh, so let's go ahead and scroll down. And uh, just recall what we were looking at before. So we did consider two types of Gaussian basis, uh, bases. So the first one was this STO3G basis for the 1S orbital on hydrogen. And the second one was the 631G basis for the 1S orbital on hydrogen. So we have our H2 molecule, um, and our first, which obviously means we have two hydrogen atoms. The first hydrogen atom, we end up having a single 1s orbital, which we use three primitive Gaussian functions on. So if you don't recall how I actually made these primitive Gaussians, uh, please check out that first video. But basically, these are the uh, alpha values and the contraction coefficients, and then I have the... Uh, Cartesian coordinates for the Gaussian, as well as the uh, angular momentum values here. Um, so this is the th three primitive Gaussians on the first hydrogen. This is three primitive Gaussians on the second hydrogen. Here, the, the, the first hydrogen's 1s orbital is just a list of these three primitive, three primitive Gaussians. 
the second hydrogen's 1s orbital is a list of these three primitive Gaussians. Finally, the molecule is a list of the 1s basis functions. And I then go to print everything this way, if you can see here. <laughs> so yeah, sorry this uh, took me so long to post this. It has been quite a while. Uh, finally, for this 631G, and, and I'll, I'll run this in a minute, the 631G basis, uh, this actually has the three primitive Gaussians on the first hydrogen. It's also got a second primitive Gaussian, but it's actually this primitive Gaussian 2. Uh, this is essentially the uh, describing the 2s orbital here. And then uh, I have these four lists here. So on the first hydrogen, there's a 1s. And on the first hydrogen, there's a 2s. There is no 2s in this basis up here. So the 631G basis has a 1s orbital and a 2s orbital on each hydrogen, whereas the STO3G only has a single 1s orbital on each hydrogen. There's, so there's no 2s orbital. So you can see here my molecule uh, has twice as many basis functions than the first one here. Anyway, so let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's run each cell. So I'll start here. Let's just go down and run it. Okay, so here's basically what we got. Uh, here's the overlap matrix of the H2 molecule in the STO3G basis, uh, where each, each hydrogen atom only has a single uh, 1s orbital. So here's the overlap matrix, it's diagonal. Uh, it, it has ones on the di uh, diagonal, and it's got about 0 0.59 on the off diagonal. Likewise, the kinetic energy matrix, electron nuclear attraction matrix, and here is the electron-electron repulsion matrix. Uh, that's pretty crazy. It is a, a n basis by four matrix. It's kind of n basis by n basis times four. I, 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 I honestly have trouble visualizing it, so I just kind of accept it. But yeah, this is it for our system. Now, what if we wanted to do the 631G basis? So let's go ahead here and put just put comments around this. And then I'm going to uncomment uh, this one. So this is the 631G basis for the 1s orbital on hydrogen. Let's go ahead and rerun this cell. And here you can see it's it's much, much larger, right? We we and this is this is what's absolutely crazy about this electron-electron repulsion integral, or, or matrix, is because you can see all we've done, the only difference between this 631G basis and this STO3G basis, is that in the 631G basis, we simply just have a single extra Gaussian. And uh, it's just, it makes such a big difference. We, we basically have doubled the size of the basis. And although in the overlap matrix, this means going uh, we go to a four by four matrix. So in the in the STO three G basis, the overlap matrix was two by two, and in the six three one G, it becomes four by four. Whereas, you know, and that's that's easy to comprehend. You go from two by two to four by four, but just just think of the scaling. Now we go. We have four electron repulsion. It's four by four by four by four. I think. Uh, and that's just, that's, that's pretty crazy. Anyways, yeah, I hope uh, this was helpful. And uh, if you're just figuring out these videos now, you can at least get to this step. Uh, what I'm actually looking forward to is in the next video, which I, I do genuinely plan to release soon, in which I will be live coding uh, like we did in the previous three, we're going to actually take these integrals or we're going to compute these matrices and we're going to put them into a self-consistent field cycle and actually solve the Hartree-Fock equations finally. Um, but yeah, I had this made from a long time ago. I uh, just caught myself up with it a little bit and just wanted to show you all. So yeah, looking forward to being back and leave some comments and take care everybody.